you know the story that we got when we were kids that your ancestor was out on one Sunday with his girlfriend and some white man jumps out of the bush and throws a net over him? It's not how it happened. Slavery was big business. Africans sold other Africans to the Europeans. But the memory of slavery and of what our ancestors must have gone through is always lurking. Even a pretty little harbor town like Elmina is dominated by its slave castle. And for us, a slave castle is like Auschwitz. Right in here. This very dungeon housed between 150 and 200 women for three good months. This is where they slept, yes. But the place was much overcrowded. So there wasn't enough space for one even to lie down. The result was an outbreak of malaria and yellow fever. So by the time the ships arrived, more than half were already dead. Well, this is the infamous room of no return. That is also the door of no return. When the slaves got here, they never knew where they were going. Neither did they know what was going to happen to them. All they knew was to get out of this room onto the boat. Some actually committed suicide. Because that was the only way they thought they could get their freedom. In fact, it was the Africans who did their raiding and selling of Africans to the Europeans. No European ever went into the hinterland to raid for slaves. It was the Africans who did it. And bef be before the Europeans even landed here, slavery was already in the system. It was slaves that worked in the palaces for the kings. I thought it was more, even at that time, than just money. It had to be just some, just something else that drove them to just kill these people. Yeah, why brutalize them like that? Why brutalize? But then again, I guess that's that's justification, the unrationalization. If you brutalize it, then you have to say to yourself, there's no way we as a Christian people could brutalize other humans, so they can't be humans. But did it surprise you when you found out that Africans were involved as well as middlemen? Um, the thing, I, I knew that Africans were involved. I didn't know the extent to what they were involved. And I also didn't know that once they found out what was going on here, and, and I know that they had to know what was going on here, that they stayed a willing participant in it. That, that's the crazy part of it. I think I was surprised and hurt and angry and everything because, you know, these were people that, you know, you know I sort of had a fantasy about them and and as our ancestors and your ancestors don't sell you so that fantasy was sort of blown away and the worst the dirtiest secret in african-american history is that a surprisingly high percentage of the free negroes in the south owned slaves themselves hmm. and some of them owned we, we explain it away by saying oh but they only own their mother or they only own, yeah they own their mother they own their sister they own their wife and they own some other workers too a great uh, um, a surprisingly high number owned workers who they did not liberate. Despite the challenges, Carruthers navigated the rough waters of discrimination to make the best of an imperfect situation in a time where choices didn't always present themselves as black or white. He was an apprentice as a barber, which was common in that time for slaves, and he was the largest African American slave owner in his time a former slave turned slave owner. The largest black slaveholder in the South, John Carruthers Stanley of North Carolina, faced a number of problems in the 1820s in dealing with a slave labor force on his three turpentine plantations in Craven County. With a total of 163 slaves, Stanley was a harsh, profit-minded taskmaster, 
and his field hands would run away. Stanley dealt with this through his two wide overseers and with a spy network that included a few trusted slaves. Brister, his slave barber in New Bern, was responsible for relaying to his owner rumors of planned escapes. On one occasion, Stanley proudly said that through the agency of the Negro man Brister he has regained such information as has enabled him to apprehend one of his slaves which had run away and to prevent the absconding of others who had manifested an intention of deserting, nor did Stanley have any pangs of conscience about selling children away from their parents or holding free blacks in bondage. In 1832 free, black Kelly Davis, also called Kelso Mabinth, petitioned the Craven County Superior Court claiming that he was being illegally held by Stanley as a slave. The court concurred and ordered Davis's release. I'm typical of African Americans of my generation. I'm obsessed with tracing my roots. For 200 years, many of my people had fantasies about coming back to Africa to live. Some actually did. But not everybody stayed. The Ghanaians tell the funniest story about the relationship between Africans and African Americans. 1957, Kwame Nkrumah became the first president of Ghana. He had been educated in the United States. He loved black Americans. He invited all black Americans to come back to Ghana, think of Ghana as their home. All these black Americans arrived in Accra about 1960. When they got here, they came to this beach. And right out there at that reef, they would um, they'd gather at midnight and they would say these magic ritualistic words from the Ashanti rituals. And then they would take their passports and fling them as far out beyond that barrier as they could. Smack their hands, say they had gotten rid of uh, American racism and they were home on the mother continent. Six weeks later, the Ghanaians that lived just around this beach uh, noticed under this full moon all these shadows on, on the beach. And so they didn't know what was going on. They thought maybe they were being invaded by another country. So they got their torches and they came down to the beach. And they looked around and what they found, those same black Americans <laughs> out beyond that barrier searching for those passports. years ago, Africa was a vast dark unknown. Only a few explorers and missionaries, the ivory hunters and the infamous slave raiders risked their lives on its blood-soaked trails. Gleaming tusks were the prize and sweating slaves, sold by their own kings and chiefs in the ceaseless tribal wars or seized by slavers. The lion and the leopard hunted savagely among the huge herds of game, and man lacking the will to understand other men, became like the beasts, and their way of life was his. Gleaming 
tusks with the prize and sweating slaves sold by their own kings and chiefs in the ceaseless tribal wars or seized by slavers. We are sorry to have to drag the United Nations into it again, but there is something we must add. We have the evidence of this British officer, Lieutenant Marlon Steele of the 37th Military Police District of Maridi. On the morning of May the 6th, 1963, five Kivu slave traders were arrested. They are guilty of having used these instruments of torture on 15 Bakudo children so as to reduce them to such a pitiful physical condition as to arouse the generosity of the passers-by. sorry and ashamed to have to insist on showing this terrible document. This young British officer who is collecting evidence is sorry and ashamed too, but it is his duty. Just as it is our duty and that of the whole civilized world, or the world that calls itself civilized and feels smugly at peace with its conscience and with God, to consider this an accusation to stop this cruelty. by her father for 100 salted loaves. The United Nations Convention on Slavery lists such a sale without the woman's consent as an act of slavery. In the Volta Republic, four women may be worth a horse with harness. But they must be young, beautiful, and well-dressed. This little girl is worth exactly 70 empty bottles. Even if she could read the United Nations Convention, it would hardly be of any help to her. its provisions against mutilating, branding, or otherwise marking a slave help this woman, dressed in rags who totters along with her ankles and chains among the crowds in a large city. 
This is Porto Novo, capital of Dahomey. We are going to a fishing village on the lagoon of Cotonou in Dahomey. This lagoon has a lovely fairy tale look, and its inhabitants contribute to the fairy tale quality as they gracefully toss their fishing nets onto the waters. But there is nothing of the fairy tale about the harsh struggle for existence of the people of this village, who live exclusively on the fish they are able to catch in the waters that surround their stilt-propped homes. The village is famous in this region for the beauty of its girls. But the lagoon provides only a meager living at best. And many of the male children urge their parents to get rid of the females, the least useful members of the community for work and fishing. Whenever one of the girls disappears, they say that the crocodiles have kidnapped her. The fishermen believe that these crocodiles are the incarnation of their ancestors, and they are therefore held to be sacred. The children look upon them as close relatives. disappeared. A father makes a fine show of lamenting and weeping. But if ever the expression has had a true meaning, these are crocodile tears. Actually, the girl has not been a victim of the crocodiles. Her father has simply sold her to a slave dealer. Where do these girls end up? Sometimes they are bought by men from nearby villages and become part of the material wealth of the new tribes. But more often, they are spirited away to the Arabian Peninsula to become concubines in the harems of the desert princes. West to east, across the heart of Africa to Arabia. This is the great highway of slavery. Across these desert trails, we took our cameras for thousands of miles in search of secret caravans. The governments of the young African republics are doing everything in their power to wipe out the slave trade. Every day, military units on camels check the border zones. They pursue the caravans and examine the documents of the desert buses. Any of these may be engaged in the slave trade. On the border of Chad and the Sudan lies Fada, the base from which the camel patrols set out. Helicopters keep watch along the border. And we have been permitted to accompany the police on one such inspection. Yesterday, pilots spotted several caravans heading toward the wells of Karuan, the only wells within a radius of 200 miles. All caravans leaving Chad to enter the Sudan must stop there to take on water after checking in at Fada. One caravan that suspiciously avoided Fada has moved into the throat of Karwan, a bottleneck deep in the mountains of Enedi. Water surging from the springs here cannot evaporate because the high mountain walls keep out the sun's rays. We reach our objective. There is no escape from the throat of Karuan. It is a dead end.
first, this caravan looks like any other moving from place to place. Camels line up for a drink. Bedouins sit motionless, impassive. The police approach with their interpreter and get permission to search the merchandise. is an odd-shaped bundle with a canvas cover. Where were they taking these children? What market were they headed for? The slave dealers won't talk. The children don't know, so the police are unable to find out, and they lose a possible chance of closing off one more market in human beings. A government official gives us an interview on the subject of slavery. <laughs> I can assure you, he says, that slavery does not exist in my country. The first official act of my government when it came into power was to draw up stringent laws against slavery. But our country is large, very large. Look at the extent of our borders. Our army and our police do everything in their power to patrol them. But it does happen that the law is violated on occasion. Can you tell me of a single country in the world in which the law is never violated? But here the law may be violated too often. Recalling Lord Mom's account of his purchase of a slave, we decided to try an experiment of our own. We prepare. Two cameras are hidden at a safe distance. A microphone is buried out of sight. Above all, we bring money. We don't have to wait long. The dealer shows up with two women we have told him we want to buy. The experiment has succeeded. We set our slaves free, seek a new master, if they are to survive. You don't have to hide yourself in a forest to buy a slave. You can buy one on the outskirts of a large city as well. This is an African city at night. One gigantic flop house. A huge bed of misery and desperation. been told of a house that sells its merchandise to the biggest traders in Eastern Africa. Our informant leads us there through narrow streets and back alleys. The then we watch a girl being bargained for by a rich merchant passing through town. Thank you. 
of the oasis of Ahila, on the edge of an airfield abandoned after the war. An old plane lands, and simultaneously a truck emerges from the darkness. takes off at dawn. Do the pilots know what cargo they are flying and where these children end up? We find our answer. Great opportunity for the slave traders lies in the pilgrimage to Mecca. Mecca is the heart of Islam, and Islam is the third religion in the world. One single Muslim country where slavery is not practiced, Prince Faisal of Saudi Arabia once said to a journalist. At last we find what we have been searching for for six months along the Persian Gulf. An open market in human beings. This one takes place in the courtyard of an old fort. Three men and three women are on sale. All Africans. They appear resigned to their fate. procured on the Arabian Peninsula. Sometimes all you have to do is organize a party, the kind the British have called slaving parties. We hear about such a party in Qatar. There's music, dancing, laughter, the kind of entertainment that doesn't take place every day in the desert. The girls come out of the shelter of their homes. They arrive from nearby villages. The canny organizers of the party have accomplished their purpose. They can study the girls at their leisure. Decide which ones they will try to buy from their fathers or their husbands which ones they will have to kidnap. Slavery, we are told, has been abolished. In point of fact, it still survives. This is the Burrow House, a plantation home in Tiny Stateburg, South Carolina, about 10 miles west of Sumter. It has been the site of many Forrest Gump-like moments. General Thomas Sumter lived here. Former Governor Stephen Miller lived here. Joel Poinsett, for whom the Poinsetta is named, died here. Even Samuel Maverick, whose son became the namesake for the term independent rebel, 
owned this house on the property. A lot of really important but not splashy historic people have wandered through here. Perhaps the quietest of them all has arguably the most important story to tell. It began here in 1935 when three young girls discovered a stack of letters while playing in the basement of this home. Those letters, now held at USC's Carolinaana Library, tell the story of a slave named April. There's been a really good job of whitewashing a very awkward discussion. It's a hugely awkward discussion. In 1802, a white plantation owner named William Ellison lent one of his young slaves, April, to work for a gin maker in Winsboro. April quickly became the go-to man for repairing the expensive cotton gins throughout the Sumter area. They send him out to the plantations and they'd take them apart. He would sharpen them on location. And that's why he heard about Stateburg. He came through here as a young man and you know, he said, well, when he bought his freedom or whatever, he came here. The center of plantation country, the wealthiest area of South Carolina. He changed his name. April was now known as William Ellison, the name of his former white owner. His gin business prospered. He bought this home, hundreds of acres of land, and eventually 68 slaves to work that land. Granger McCoy now lives in the Ellison home and says he often finds old cotton gin blades. What do the Ellison say when they come? They're looking for the home place. All descendants of what many of us thought an impossible oxymoron, a black slave owner. I had a black ophthalmologist come through here, Ellison, and we sat on this couch right here. And his great-great-granddaddy owned 68 slaves, and here I am, white, over here, and my great-great-granddaddy didn't own any slaves. And it, it was like a, uh, somebody blew a dog whistle in a kennel, everybody was just kind of turning the head not knowing how to handle all this. History tumbles you. And what little we can learn about Ellison as a slave owner isn't pretty. The book Black Masters chronicles Ellison's life in the antebellum South and suggests that his slaves were the worst fed and clothed of any in Stateburg. It also suggests that Ellison was a slave breeder, selling off infant girls, a practice even some white owners found cruel. Whatever the case, Ellison certainly had a good relationship with other white aristocracy. This contract shows that Ellison didn't just buy a home in wealthy Stateburg, he bought it directly from former Governor Stephen Miller a governor and former slave trading property. He was the wealthiest black man in South Carolina, the fourth wealthiest in the South, wealthier than more than 90 percent of whites. Just a few hundred yards from the Ellison home is the Ellison graveyard, private, neither mixed with other white nor black tombstones, symbolic of his unusual position in the pre-war South, a position so few of us even knew existed. Whatever happened during Reconstruction and then up through the Jim Crow era, anything and everything that had to deal with the relationships between the blacks and the whites just went underground. And may have remained so, if not for a stack of letters found under his house. For Hidden Columbia, Anderson Burns, ABC Columbia News. All these black, you know, we, we exaggerate how many black people ran away to the North Star. Uh, even John Hope Franklin, at most, counted 50,000. And that includes people who would just run down to the swamp, hide out for the night, and then come back. You know, it was hard to run away to the north. There were not millions of black people on the Underground Railroad. We tend to think of the under Underground Railroad like Penn Station, a Grand Central Station. <laughs> it wasn't like that. It was incredibly difficult to escape from slavery. And, as you know, Mr. Black, many of the free Negroes stayed in the South. Do you know in the 1860 census, there were, there were 440,000 about free Negroes, I mentioned that earlier. More than half lived in the states that were the Confederacy and the border states where slavery was free. And they stayed there, ladies and gentlemen, unmolested, including my family in eastern West Virginia. They stayed there because that, that's where they had their family and that's where they had their property. Remember their property, was, they had to be given property in Virginia and many of these other southern states. What are they going to do? Go to New York? Live in Harlem? Hang out and, and listen to jazz with Dizzy, you know, uh, uh, Charlie Parker? They stayed where they were, were raised. And many of them, this is the worst, this is the, the worst, the dirtiest secret in African American history, is that a surprisingly high percentage of the free Negroes in the South owned slaves themselves. Mm. And some of them owned we, we explain it away by saying, oh, but they only own their mother, or they only own... Yeah, 
They own their mother, they own their sister, they own their wife, and they own some other workers too. A great, uh, um, a surprisingly high number owned workers who they did not liberate uh, in, th throughout the South. It's, there were enough black free Negroes who supported the Confederacy that they voluntarily formed a regiment in the state of North Carolina to fight for the Confederacy. And black Confederate troops are featured on the cover of Harper's Weekly in 1863. Frederick Douglass used this as an argument to make Lincoln allow black men to fight. Wow. Because remember, Lincoln didn't want to do it. Lincoln made a famous statement in 1862. He said, I suppose we could arm them, but if we did, the arms, their arms would end up in the hands of the Confederates within a week. Because he thought that they were incompetent, not smart enough to win. And eventually, as I said, the North was losing the war. Frederick Douglass was agitating. And this book um, by Case Moore uh, persuaded him to change his mind and incrementally. So again, we, it's not only the myth makers who created the, the idealized Lincoln. We have our own sure. myth makers in the African American historical establishment. All the Egyptians were, looked like Michael Jordan. All our people were black gods and kings. You know, we were not complicitous in the slave trade. There wouldn't be a slave trade. Africans sold other Africans to white people. That was the slave trade. That's the first thing we honestly have to admit. That the, remember the story of Stanley, uh, I mean, Livingston, Dr. Livingston? Sure. The reason that was so important is that almost no white men had penetrated the interior of Africa. What was there? No roads, snakes, mosquitoes, death, malaria, right? The white people were along the coast. It was black kingdoms like Queen and Jinga's kingdom in Angola, what's now Angola, Ghana, Dahomey. They grew rich from the slave trade, selling other Africans. They would go and wage wars just to sell other black people to white people. This is something we've been so ashamed about, we pretend that it's not true. It is the nasty, dirty secret of African American history. We are just as corrupt and despicable as any other people. And if we have the right to oppress, we will oppress just like the white man oppressed us. That is human nature. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. And the only way to overcome that is to be honest about it, is to be honest about it, admit the truth, and then all try to, to uh, do better. As my, my main man, Guy and my so much, Cornell West says, we're all recovering races. We're recovering, <laughs> we're all recovering races. I went to the Gilbert Archives like you suggested, and I found out a lot of interesting things, especially about your family. Yes, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have come from such a rich and diversified African-American family. Now, diversified is right. I mean, imagine coming from an African-American family that owned over 100 slaves. Are, are you saying that my family owned slaves, black slaves? Back in the early 1800s, you had a relative named Jeremiah. Great, 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 Jeremiah. He was a free slave. He, he got rich from making cotton gins. And part of his wealth went into buying slaves. There must be some mistake. No. This doesn't look like a mistake. That's a reproduction of a bill of sale. Your great-great-granddaddy had just bought ten new slaves. Now, he was a free man of color, but he was also a black master. But, Lena, I didn't know that black people owned other black people. Only a few did. Now we know why you're so bossy. It's DNA. <laughs> Them no good ancestors. <laughs> Lena, Lena, wait a minute. How about the free blacks in America in 1860 during slavery? The leading African-American historian, John Hope Franklin of Duke, records that in New Orleans, which had the largest concentration of free blacks in the South, over 3,000 or 28% of free Negroes owned slaves. So free blacks in New Orleans were five times more likely to have black slaves than the average white southerner. You see, there's no unique evil in white people. So you take into account African history and African-American, 
is far more likely to have a direct ancestor who enslaved black people than is a white person. Should black people today be punished for their history of slavery? That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But it's exactly what the discrimination against whites and reparations are justified by.